At the age of 30, Jesus burst onto the scene, seemingly out of nowhere. A young rabbi who attracted the masses with remarkable wisdom, radical acceptance, and miraculous signs. Years before the crowd would call for his crucifixion, they cheered him as a celebrity. Join us as we turn to the Gospel of Luke and focus on the years of Jesus' popularity. As you uncover the truth of the real Jesus, you'll find the source of your own story's significance. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Preston Trail. I'm so grateful you have joined us today, whether online or here in the building. And if you are cognitively aware of what's going on in the world, you know that we are in the middle of March Madness here in the United States. And I'm thinking some of you are going to find this message incredibly encouraging and helpful because yesterday the storms came and the wind blew and your bracket just crashed and burned. Mine included, so, uh, so I think it's gonna be a, a helpful Sunday for you. And quite frankly, a broken bracket is the least of our worries in the world we're living in today, but I think God has something really important to say to each of us. But to get into that, I wanna take a little bit of a, a side view and ask you a question. How many of you are familiar with the Darwin Awards? Anybody ever heard of those? Now, the Darwin Awards are, by their own description, a tongue-in-cheek, recognition and honor of individuals who have actually contributed to human evolution by selecting themselves out of the gene pool, either by dying or becoming sterilized because of their own actions. Now, let me tell you about a couple of uh, Darwin Award recipients. In 2008, David Monk was on holiday skiing with friends. And after having a few beers, they decided to steal a protective mat that covered one of the metal towers that actually guides the lift to the top of the mountain. They wanted to use it as a sled. So they hiked up the hill, hurled themselves down it in their newly acquired sled and promptly slammed into the very barrier that they had stolen the protective matting from. At his funeral, David Monk's friend said, he was a brilliant guy. Brilliant maybe, Wise, not so much. In 1997, in Reston, Virginia, uh, the police department there issued a statement saying they had found the body of a 22-year-old young man who had apparently died trying to bungee jump from a 70-foot bridge. Now, he had eschewed the normal bungee jumping operations and had taken matters into his own hands. So he had bought some bungee cords, tied them together, and then he strapped himself onto them securely, tied the other end to the bridge, and then jumped, confident in the knowledge that he had measured accurately the length of the drop just short of 70 feet. However, he failed to take into consideration that bungee cord stretch. And he too became eligible for the posthumous award, uh, the Darwin Award, right? So here's the thing. Now, I know it's, we feel a little bit bad about maybe chuckling about that, but we all know that humor is tragedy plus time, okay? So it's been a while, but here's something I don't want us to miss. The Darwin Awards point out the distinction between wisdom and foolishness. And that distinction can have life and death implications, and Jesus' teaching that we'll be looking at today is going to help us in the very same way. He is going to help us distinguish between a wise life and a foolish life. Now, if I could begin by just simply uh, setting a, a phrase or a sentence out there to kind of give you a clue about the bottom line of where we're going, it would be this today. Jesus teaches us the wisdom that enables us to survive and thrive in this life and in the life to come. So our text today is gonna be found in Luke chapter six, verses 46 through 49. I wanna encourage you to open your Bibles there. If you have an analog Bible like me or whether you have it on your phone or a tablet, uh, these are some of the most important verses in the New Testament. They are worth highlighting, marking some way so that you can go back to them and think through them. 
And today, I'm simply gonna walk through this text verse by verse, and hopefully by the end of our time together, you'll have a, a greater appreciation for the life that Jesus is calling us to and the hope that he offers us in doing so. So here we go, Luke chapter six, verse 36 begins like this. Jesus speaking, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Now let me ask you a question. How do you hear Jesus say this? Now this is written on a flat piece of paper, so we don't get the tone of voice, we don't see his body language, but when you hear Jesus say, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? How are you hearing it? It's easy to hear it from a really judgmental perspective. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and never do what I say? Or he could have been saying it with a spirit of curiosity. Hey, I was wondering, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, but like you never do what I say? Now, the more you read the New Testament, you discover that Jesus, in all four books of the Gospels in the early part of the New Testament, he asks 307 questions. He personally is asked 183, and he only answers three of them specifically. So Jesus' whole way of teaching is through curiosity, wanting people to ask and answer questions for themselves because he knows if we work these questions out, we will be much more likely to live into them. So I do think that he is probably asking with a spirit of curiosity and not judgmentalism, but quite frankly, how you hear this statement is really determined by your view of God. Now, as you read the Old and New Testaments, there are different metaphors and names that are given to God. And quite frankly, we need all of those metaphors because God's nature is so immense and so incomprehensible. No single metaphor can truly capture who God is. But there are some predominant metaphors that are used. And I wanted to share those with you this morning. So here are two views of God. And uh, one, of, one of the primary metaphors is this, is that God is king. Now, when you see God through the lens of king, there's some things that kind of go along with that. And the primary expression of a king is command and control, right? And if you are a king, a king wants something from you. He wants your allegiance. He wants your tax money. He wants things that he needs for his purposes in the world. And so a king is a view or a metaphor that helps us understand the nature of God. But it has its own understanding as well. Here's another one. God is father. We see this in the New Testament. It's quite frankly unique to Jesus. And if God is a father, that particular metaphor, the primary expression of a father is love and guidance. And what does a father want for his children? A father wants something for his children. Now, how do these things play out as we come to understand God? Well, I think, first of all, when it comes to the operation of creation, God is all about command and control. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and God spoke and said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. In Colossians 1.17, the apostle Paul is speaking about Jesus who's now been resurrected and now he is with his father in heaven. And he says that Christ existed from the very beginning and even now he holds all things together. When it comes to the operation of creation, I'm glad God is king because it is about command and control. But when it comes to human relationships, I believe God is all about love and guidance. In fact, this is even picked up in the Old Testament in Psalm 23, where the psalmist writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. What does he do? He guides me in right paths. Flip over to the New Testament. Jesus 
Saying about the birds, the birds of the air, they don't sow or reap or store anything in barns, but their heavenly father feeds them and cares for them. How much more will your heavenly father do for you? Because how much more valuable are you than even the birds? And so when it comes to human relationships, that's why I think Jesus gives us this metaphor that we're to consider God to be like the best of all fathers. Now, there's some implications if we misuse these metaphors. And let me lay those out for you. The first one is this. When you view God primarily as king, and that's your predominant metaphor, it makes obedience an obligation. Let me say it again. When you make God as king, your primary metaphor, it makes obedience an obligation. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter eight, there's a wonderful conversation between Samuel, who was kind of leading Israel at that time, and God, and it seems that the nation of Israel now wanted a king so they could be like the other countries. And uh, God recognizes he's not gonna win that with them, with them. So he says, okay, Samuel, I'm gonna give them a king, but you gotta tell them about a king. You need to tell them that the king is gonna claim his rights. And some of their sons are gonna be used for his military exploits. Others are going to reap his harvest. Your daughters will now become his domestic attendants. He's gonna take your best fields, your best vineyards, your best olive groves, and he's gonna give them to his attendants. And he's gonna take your servants and your cattle and your donkeys, and he's going to take a tenth of your grain and your wine and your flocks, and you will become his slave, God says. Because you see, kings want things from people. And quite frankly, if a king, all he does is take from you and demand from you, it becomes very difficult for you to want to obey him. Because if you don't, you know you have to because he'll judge you, he may punish you. And so you obey only out of obligation. Even in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, multiple times Moses writes there, if you obey, you will prosper. If you disobey, you will perish. You are obligated to obey if you want to be blessed, all right? Now, on the other hand, When you view God primarily as father, it makes obedience a grateful response. Think about that. Your father knows how many hairs you have on your head, and he has to keep track of a lot of us more than others. He says to us, when we knock, he will open the door to us. When we seek him, we will find him. When we ask him for good things, he will give us good things. He offers us forgiveness for all of our sins, through Jesus who gave his life for us. He makes it possible for us to be reconciled to him. God the Father has given you and me every possible reason to believe that he wants to bless us, that he wants to give us his favor, that he wants to work for our well-being. And when you begin to understand that, then obeying him becomes the most natural, grateful response. So Jesus begins by asking us this very important question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? And how we hear that is gonna set us up for the rest of his teaching. Here's what he says in verse 47. I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me listens to my teaching, and then follows it. He said, I'm gonna show you the results of what happens when you obey me with a grateful heart. But before I get to that, what Jesus does here actually, as he kind of leads up to this, he lays out for us the appropriate pathway for a disciple, a pathway to salvation. Now, salvation is a word that if you grew up You know, in a lot of evangelical churches, salvation tends to simply only refer to being saved from hell when you die. But the biblical meaning of that is way richer and has way more depth. It means to be delivered from bondage. It means to be rescued. It means to be saved from ourselves. It means to be 
delivered from death. It means to be made whole uh, as well as to be saved at the end of time. And so what Jesus is doing here in this text, he is speaking about salvation both in this life and in the life to come. Now, I think we all recognize this, that in this life, we're always scrambling to find happiness and validation and love and fulfillment. And we all have a track record of looking for all these things in the usual places, like in money and sex and power and stuff, a new job or a new relationship. We long for more likes on Instagram or TikTok. We search out self-help websites we might try to check out some success gurus or new age philosophies, or even we'll uh, give a health and wealth gospel a chance. At times we even may say, I'm just gonna renew my spiritual fervor and I'm just gonna start doing a bunch of religious things, hoping that that will put God in my debt and it will merit that he'll give me this life that I want. But as Alison Harrell shared with us three weeks ago, uh, out of a Harvard study, we realize that as human beings, our wanter is broken. What that means is, is that we have a tendency to want the things in our lives that ultimately will not satisfy us. And so we try one thing after another, down one rabbit hole and then another, and ultimately after a series of disappointments, sometimes we come to the end of our cultural rope and we're ready to give up or give in. And that's when we can hear Jesus invite us to this pathway of discipleship that begins with, come to me, come to me. Jesus knows that you're facing incredible cultural and peer pressure to continue to find your best life in the world's way. But Jesus is saying, come to me, change your way of thinking. There might be a better idea. There might be another way that lasts. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, he expounds on this invitation to come to him. And I love this passage and all that it implies. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus understands that life is difficult and hard and many of us have very heavy burdens to carry. And what he's saying is, if you will come to me, I will help you, teach you, I will lighten your load. And he uses the metaphor of a yoke. A yoke was used back in that day agriculturally. And you can see it was a specifically designed piece of wood that would fit over the shoulders of individual oxen. Because Jesus was a carpenter, he probably made dozens of those yokes and they had to fit each individual oxen perfectly because if they didn't fit, the wood under the weight of carrying the burden would gouge into the oxen, bruise it, bruise the bones of the oxen and it would be even more painful. But what Jesus is saying, the life I have for you, what I'm inviting you to fits you perfectly and it will actually lighten the load of life that you are having to pull. Now here's what I don't want you to miss. This pathway to a life that is worth living begins with a relationship. That's where it has to start, with the one who came to earth for you, with the one who shares his wisdom with you, a relationship with the one who gave himself for you, and now when you begin to understand who he is, then it begins to draw you into him and you at least want to listen to him next. Come to me, he says, and then listen to my teaching. Now, as you read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, 
You will notice that on many occasions before Jesus has a teaching time in the gospels, he will say something like this. He who has ears to listen, let him hear or let her hear. Now, what he is saying is this. There's a difference between listening and truly hearing and understanding. If you're a husband, you understand this distinction very clearly. I can listen really well. I do not often hear well, right? But Jesus is saying this, listen to what I'm saying, and then I want you to hear it. I want you to understand it. I want you to comprehend it. I want you to weigh it. I want you to vet it. I want you to study it. I want you to process it. I want you to even try it on for a bit and see whether or not you believe that what I'm saying is in fact true. Uh, before Christmas, I uh, came to be aware of a book by an author by the name of Annie Duke entitled Thinking in Bets. And in her book, she recites some studies about how human beings like you and me come to shape and form our beliefs. Now, when they studied people, and I think we would probably all agree with this, if I were to ask you, how do you form and shape your beliefs, we would all say, well, I hear something, and then I vet it, and I process it, and then if it's true, then I believe it. But research actually says we do something very opposite of that, that overwhelmingly, this is how human beings shape and form their beliefs. We hear something and then we believe it. And then if we ever get around to it or we really need to, then we will vet it. Uh, Daniel Gilbert is a Harvard psychologist and he's done this study and a lot more like this. And here's what he concludes about you and me. We are credulous creatures who find it easy to believe and difficult to doubt. He says, as a result, the human default category is to believe what we hear and read is true. That's our default category. If you see it on the internet, it's true. If you see it on cable news, it's gotta be true. If we read it or hear it, our predisposition is to believe that it's true. Even in the studies, when they actually presented that the information was false, People still believed it was true. And we wonder why we have so many crazy conspiracy theories because people will believe anything is true. Now here's the thing. I wanna ask you to identify in your mind and heart right now what philosophy of life have you shaped your life around? Maybe it's the American dream. If I can just accomplish that dream in my life, I will have arrived, I will have the, the best possible life I could ever have thought. Maybe you have shaped your life and your values around the moral relativism that's around in our culture today. Hey, my truth is my truth, your truth is your truth, and I can just do whatever feels right and good to me. Have you shaped and ordered your life around the fact that you believe that uh, Money is the only thing that counts in the world. And here's the truth. Many times we shape and order our lives around these beliefs and philosophies and we never vet them. We never really study them. We never think through what are the long-term implications of me ordering my life around these things. And what Jesus is saying from the get-go, I want you to listen to my teaching. I want you to hear me teach about loving God with your whole mind, heart, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. I wanna challenge you to love your enemy because in fact, that might allow you to turn enemies into friends. I wanna teach you I, want you, I want you to listen that if you actually treat people the way you wanna be treated, they may in fact end up treating you that way as well, and you're gonna get out of life what you get into it. What he's saying is I want you to think about this and vet it and study it and discern whether or not you really believe this is true. And I wanna challenge each of you to do that, to really seek to understand. And when you begin to get a sense that it is true, you go to the next step, which is then you follow it. Come to Jesus, listen to his teaching, and then follow it. James 1.22 says this, but don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. 
Otherwise, and here's that little phrase, you will be fooling yourselves. You'll be missing the mark between what is wisdom and what is foolishness. Now, there is a great temptation in Bible-based churches in America to believe that the pinnacle of discipleship is simply knowing the Bible. That is, I know people who stack up one Bible study on top of another, hoping that someday they'll get their discipleship merit badge and they can wear it proudly. But I have some troubling news for you. The evil one could walk into any seminary in America tomorrow and ace a final on the New Testament or the Old Testament or systematic theology without even studying. Is the evil one a disciple? Is the evil one on the pathway to salvation? Nope. Here's what you must not miss. It is a life and death distinction. There is a difference between believing that Jesus and believing in Jesus. Let me go a little bit deeper. You see, most of us have this misunderstanding that we live a life of faith by believing that Jesus was God's son, by believing that Jesus died for me, by believing that Jesus can save me if I pray to him, that believing if I pray a prayer of salvation, that I will be saved and will go to heaven. Now it is believing that Jesus that is what leads to Jesus' uh, question that we began with. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and never do what I say. Well, if you think that the Christian life is simply beginning and ending with believing some things about Jesus, then you never get around to following him and obeying him. What Jesus is saying is that the true way of salvation is believing in Jesus. Because I believe that all those things are true about him, I'm gratefully willing to believe in him, in his person, but not just in his person, but in his ideas, in his teaching, in his values, in his way of life, in how and who he loves, how he serves others, his way of seeing God, and the way that you find true life. The road of salvation means that you're willing to entrust all of your life to him and what you believe to be true about him. And so as a result, because you come to believe in him and who he is and his way of living, then following and obeying his commandments, they then become the most natural thing in the world for you to do. Now, I wanna say one other thing about this, the order is really crucial. Getting these in the right order is very important. And Jesus gave us the right order. Come to me, listen to my teaching, and then follow me. And here's the truth. Listening to Jesus and then following him is the telltale sign that you've come to him and you've experienced his grace and his love and his forgiveness. However, unfortunately, there have been too many through the years who have heard that before you come to Jesus, that you have to listen to his teaching and obey him. Now, if you do the former, you come to him and now you're listening and you're following is an expression of your gratitude to all that he's done for you. That's grace in life. But if you think you have to listen and obey before you can come to him, That's about keeping the law. That's about attempting to deserve and merit God's approval and salvation. And it's a dead end road because none of us are perfect. We're gonna always fall short. We're gonna be frustrated. We're gonna be really, quite frankly, dishonest with ourselves to try to keep up a good front because we can't keep up. It often leads to a putrid self-righteousness and judgmentalism. And ultimately, it's a miserable way to live because we cannot live up to those expectations. Several years ago, uh, Robin and I were on a mission trip to Uganda and on a day off, we sailed to the Ngamba Island Chimpanzee Sanctuary uh, on Lake Victoria. A beautiful place, incredible experience in many ways. Now, when we got there, the park rangers gave us a risk assessment of what would happen if one of the chimpanzees got loose and escaped from their natural habitat. 
I want to perhaps burst some of your bubbles. Chimpanzees are not like cheetah on Tarzan. They will rip your face off. They will pull your kidneys out and eat them for a snack. They're one and a half to four times stronger than you. They're faster than any human. And one researcher said there is never a safe time to be in the same place as a chimp. And so the park ranger said, if the siren goes off, you run as fast as you can to the shore and get in the water because chimps won't go in the water. So here's the thing. We believe the park rangers were legit. They were who they said they were. And then when they taught us about the nature of chimps, we believed their teaching. And so if that alarm went off, we weren't gonna hesitate to obey him. We are headed right to the shore. It was gonna be every man, every woman for herself to get there, right? You see, the truth of the matter is when you believe in Jesus and what he's telling you is true, then following him is the most natural and rational thing you could ever do. Now, the last two verses, Luke 6, 48 through 49, Jesus is going to illustrate the implications of these things. He's gonna be talking about two builders, and each one signifies what happens when they either follow Jesus' wisdom or not. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays a foundation on solid rock when the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it was well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. Now Jesus is using the metaphor of building a house to signify the building of a life. Each one of us right now are in the process of building and constructing, shoring up, outfitting our lives. And he has some things to say about how we do that. First of all, when it comes to building a life, wise builders dig deep and build on a strong foundation. And the implication is upon Jesus' person and teaching. And the point is they dig deep into this good news opportunity. They weigh it, they vet it, they process it, they count the cost. They take the long-term look. The long view is what they're banking on. In Jesus' day in Palestine, people only built houses in the summer. But it was in the fall and the winter when the storms would come and what looked like a dry gulch would be a roaring river. They had the long view in mind. And what Jesus is recognizing that building a life takes energy and time and planning and perseverance and a lot of faith. But that's what wise builders do. On the other hand, when it comes to building a life, foolish builders drift along without building on a strong foundation. Foolish life builders drift through life. They just take it as it comes. They build on whatever looks good at the time. Oh, this looks like a piece of dry ground. I can build my life here. And they build on perhaps the latest fad or the prevailing philosophy. And for them, they're always seeking immediate gratification and they are unconcerned about inevitable storms. And then Jesus kind of pulls the punchline here. And here's what he says. When the storms come, wise builders will survive and thrive. Foolish builders will crash and burn. And there's a lot going on right here. Let me kind of parse this out for you. The word storms in both Old and New Testament language can refer to two things. It can refer to difficulties, challenges, problems, losses in life, but it also refers to judgment, the end of time when we stand before God. And here what Jesus is saying is, Hey, listen, whether you're a foolish builder or a wise builder, you're gonna experience storms. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm sorry if anyone ever gave you uh, the, the implication that if you follow Jesus, you're now exempt from difficulty and challenges and heartache. That is not true. Storms come to all of us. But also what Jesus is reminding us 
is that everything happens for a reason. Now, how many of you ever heard people say that, like in a time of loss? Everything happens for a reason. Now, a lot of times we say that to bring comfort when we think when something bad happens, well, I don't know why this happened, but you know, maybe God has a reason, so I'm just gonna trust that everything happens for a reason. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. What he's saying is this. If you build your life on the foundation of Jesus' person and his teaching and the storms come and the wind blows and the thunder crashes and when it's over, you emerge because you have this divine resiliency and you have your life and your heart and your soul and your hopes intact, the reason you have that is because you came to Jesus and you listened to him, and you followed him. Things happen for a reason. On the other hand, if you build your life on not a foundation, and when storms come, and when the winds blow, and things collapse around you, it's not some mysterious thing that God happened. It happened for a reason, because you failed to come to Jesus and to listen to his teaching and to follow him. And one day, when we stand before God in eternity, and if you have built your life on the foundation of Jesus, you will have something to stand on when you give an account to God for your life. But if you did not build your life on that strong foundation, you will have nothing to stand on when you stand before God to give an account for your life. And in that moment, and in moments when storms in this life hit, things will come crashing down around you. You know, here's something we rarely talk about, should probably talk about more, but there is a cost to non-discipleship. There is a cost to not following Jesus. And if I could sum that up in one thought, it would be this. If you choose not to build your life on this foundation, one day you are going to be eligible to win a spiritual Darwin Award. You have the opportunity and you have the knowledge, but you did not follow the wisdom of Jesus. And my hope and prayer for each one of us, wherever we are in our journey today, whatever condition our home, our house of our life is in, that if you don't have a great foundation, that you'll start today building it. And you can do that by just turning your heart and spirit to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm in. Thank you for your grace and love. I don't know all that that means, but I'm just gonna turn and I'm gonna embrace you and I want to hear from you. I want to listen, show me, guide me. And because I'm convinced that you love me and you care for me, I'm going to follow you wherever you lead me. No matter what it costs, I'm just so grateful. I'll follow you anywhere. Or maybe today as a follower of Jesus, you have that foundation, but you've been building on your life with things that are perishable. And you need to go back and rethink what you're building your life with. You know, we are living in difficult days. In fact, I haven't seen this much uncertainty in history since I was 13 in 1968 when truly all hell broke loose in, in our country. And if we, if you ever needed a strong foundation, it is now. And I hope and pray that you will embrace the wisdom of Jesus and I can just sum it up and say it one more time like this. Jesus does not want something from you. He wants something for you. And when you grasp the significance of this, it will draw you to him. It will inspire you to listen to him and it will motivate you to obey him with a grateful heart. And you will survive and thrive in this life, in the life to come, no matter what. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you, thank you for the promise of Jesus. Thank you for his coming, for his love, for his sacrificial gift on our behalf. Thank you for grace. It's all grace. And yet as we face this grace, we have to respond to it. And, 
And we trust in your truth, not just believing in you, but believing what you tell us about reality and about God and about the way life works. And Father, I just pray that more and more of us out of this grateful heart will follow you in this incredibly challenging time. And in so doing, our lives would be an inspiration to those around us who would be foolish, but could be wise. Lord, that's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Cannot thank you guys enough for being a part of our time today of worship and study. I wanna just give you one very brief announcement before you leave. Over the past eight months, our elder team has been involved with some crucial conversations with our McKinney campus leadership. And today, Paul is at our McKinney campus making a very important announcement about the future of that campus location. And we want you to be informed as well. So when you get home, you will have waiting for you in your inbox an email and a video from Paul and myself, and we'd encourage you to take a look at it as soon as you can. Again, thank you for being here. If we can pray for you, encourage you in any way, stop by the prayer over here, the cross over here. We would love to, to serve you in that way. And don't miss next week. Paul will be back. We'll be talking about the real Jesus showing us compassion when we're hurting. See you then. God bless you.